Good evening, and welcome to Grimm's Ghost Stories. Today's story is my first day on the job at a substation in Texas was nothing short of terrifying. Written by Wayne Cummins. I've had a lot of shit jobs. Most of them have been hard labor, either in the sun or in close proximity to large and hot equipment. I've been a grill man, a hot tar roofer, a construction hard hat, and a slew of other temporary jobs that seem to be my style. I've never been the type for a sit-down 9-to-5 office job. I tried once, working for a call center and having my mind and ass go numb for 8 hours straight. I couldn't take it any longer than a week. My friends found that odd from someone who can shovel dirt or work a jackhammer for a whole day and not seem phased. I always figured it was my nature, and I accepted a normal job would never suit me. So when I heard of an opening for an electrical substation in the middle of nowhere, it seemed right up my alley. I'd gotten tired of working for my asshole of a boss at the plastic factory. I didn't mind the massively heavy sheets of plastic I had to lug, the crazy hot and dangerous melting and molding equipment, or the poisonous fumes that we had to safeguard ourselves against extensively to keep from inhaling, and those safeguards weren't exactly foolproof. But what really got to me was the way my boss would clap his hands at us when he would shout orders, like we were fucking dogs. Yeah, I've found a lot of stupid reasons to leave a job, but again, I think it's just my nature. I applied online for a few jobs, and like everything I've signed up for online, it incurred a whole lot of junk emails to flood my inbox. This time, it was a slew of job offers from all over. Most were offices, aka immediately deleted emails. A few more were for more physical jobs, but none of them paid any better than what I had at the time. Finally, I was up late one night wasting time on the internet when I randomly decided to check my email. I saw I had one new message in my inbox from a company called Electric Solutions of Texas. I'd never heard of them before. The email was a job offer for an entry-level electrician to work third shift at a stub station. The details stated that the applicant had to be ready for long, weary hours and isolation. Two things I had no problem with. In fact, I rather like isolation. I responded to the email with my electric resume and received a reply within the hour. I thought it was a little odd at 2 in the morning, but I couldn't have been the only night owl reading emails, I suppose. I was to have an interview slash orientation tomorrow night at 8 p.m. The address was out of town by about 30 minutes, and it was in a patch of deadlands I'd hardly even heard of, let alone been to. Wasn't the first time I'd have a long commute to the job, the way I saw it. I drove out to the location through the Texas flatlands. I saw a few dried up fields and a whole lot of dirt and rock as far as the eye could see. I hadn't seen a car for at least 15 minutes. I drove with my windows down on my old Chevy truck and I saw the moon was unusually bright and noted the lack of clouds in the sky. The light of the night sky made the world glow a dim hue of white, like I was driving alone on the moon. As I neared the dirt road, referenced in the email, I was haunted by John Fogarty and his 14-minute rendition of Heard It Through the Grapevine. The dirt road was another 20 slow minutes of a bumpy ride. I'd gotten so far down the road I couldn't see the highway in my rear view, despite there being nothing but level land behind it and my taillights. Finally, I came up on a single building, sitting all by its lonesome in the middle of the wide open dirt and dust. It wasn't quite a shack, but not much better. There was a fenced off section connected to the concrete building with humming breakers and transformers. No power lines to speak of, so I had to assume it was all routed underground. I parked next to an old, dirty, indented Bronco out front, glanced inside the Bronco as I got out of my truck. There was an old leather suitcase on the passenger seat and a very detailed and gloomy crucifix hanging from the mirror. As I headed for the front door, about five feet from reaching it, it opened. Out stepped a lanky man standing a little over six feet, with a bad comb over and a goofy grin full of protruding upper teeth. He looked to be in his mid to late fifties. I was taken aback just a little by the fact that he opened the door before I even had a chance to knock. He must have noticed because he addressed it as he reached out to shake my hand with his skinny fingers that reminded me of spider's legs. Sorry to startle you there, young fella. 
Saw your Chevy heading up on the cameras, he said, motioning his head up to the corner of the building. There was a tiny black camera attached to the top left corner of the building, slowly panning side to side. The name's Walter. You must be Billy. Come on in and I'll show you the ropes. His handshake was limp and moist and a little cold to the touch, like shaking hands with a dead fish. It gave me some uncomfortable goosebumps, but I grinned and took it. He motioned me to head through the big steel reinforced door, and I did so with a tiny shiver running up my spine. The front room was a tiny reception area with two fold-out metal chairs sitting against the tanned oak wall. The floors were a drab gray that reminded me of the color of ticks my dog sometimes gets. It made my stomach turn just a little. The idea of a reception room seemed weird for an electric substation, but I didn't give it too much thought. We headed through the next door. Walter pointed out the break room and the bathroom. Everything was old and a little vintage. It didn't seem like anything in here was newer than 78. There was a calendar on the wall that had a blonde with feathered hair and a tiny white bikini sprawled out on the hood of a firebird. It, I didn't bother looking at the year. There was a small fridge, a single fold-out table with three chairs, a tiny bulletin board on the wall by the calendar, and a dingy ceiling fan with a soft yellow bulb. The bathroom was a little more than a closet with a toilet and a sink, both of which were stained brown and black by age. Walter must have seen me take notice of the Firebird babe because he smiled at me with his big teeth. That's my Shirley, he said. He patted the calendar right on the blonde's barely there panties. You treat her right when you're here all by your lonesome. I just smirked and gave him what I hoped was a convincing laugh. Then he showed me through the next door into the security room. The room was smaller than the others, except for the bathroom, and it was giving the shitter a run for its money as far as tiniest rooms go. There was an old office chair that still looked pretty comfortable, despite its worn look. In front of it was a control board and a wall of tiny TV monitors. Four of the monitors displayed the open desert in every direction one of which showed my truck and Walter's beat-up Bronco, and another displaying the fenced-off breakers and transformers. The row above that showed the rooms I'd already been in, except the bathroom, but that somehow wouldn't have surprised me. The row above that were four screens displaying a tunnel that stretched on for what looked like forever. It was lined with pipes and wires of every color and make, and there was a single hanging light every 20 feet or so. One of the monitors displayed a door that led into the tunnel. It looked like it was a little wrecked too, as though something had scraped hard against it, but the thick steel door shunned it off with just a nice big scar to show for it. What's that place, I asked, pointing at the monitors with the tunnel displayed. That's the endless walk, as I've grown to call it. Walter responded with a longing sigh. That's where you'll be twice a night. That door is the elevator down to it. He motioned to a sliding metal door on the other side of the security room. You've got to make the walk at 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. just to record levels and general checkup. He put his hand on my shoulder before turning away from the monitors. The melancholy smile had faded to a grim expression on his horse face. The blue hue from the monitors cast an eerie glow on his features. He stared at me like a phantom as he spoke again. Now, boy, don't you go down there any time aside from 10 and 3 and only for 25 minutes at the longest when you do. It gets all kinds of dangerous and unsafe. Not a friendly place to be if you catch my meaning. He said as a thin smile gradually spread across his face. His dimples looked like fissures in the desert. I should have understood that warning for what it was. Creepy as hell. But I've worked a ton of dangerous jobs, and it wasn't too out of the ordinary for me to get warnings like that on the first day. Walter quickly walked me through the job duties. I'd done some electrician work a few times, and this was all pretty simple stuff. Just keeping an eye on a few levels and making sure there was nothing that needed repairs or replacement. If so, there was a small shack out in the fenced-off area with the transformers that served as a tiny stockroom. Anything I'd need for maintenance would be there, or so I was told. The phone in the security room and at the reception window both had a list of Walter's numbers and local emergency services, as well as the only delivery place that would come out to this place, and I quote Walter, they'll charge you out the ass for delivery, but it's a hell of a good pizza. After giving me all the instruction I'd need, which took all of 15 minutes, Walter gave me a small set of keys and said his goodbyes and took off down the road in his Bronco. 
I watched him go from the doorway before all I could see was a small cloud of dust heading towards the dark horizon. I headed back inside and sat down in the comfy office chair in front of the monitors. I'd tried switching the light in the security room on, but it didn't work. I looked up to find there was no bulb in the fixture. I shrugged and just left the door to the break room open. I sat there for about an hour, staring at the monitors and keeping an eye on the control board. At about 9.30, I decided I couldn't take the silence any longer and headed out to my truck to grab my mp3 player. I stepped outside and found it to be surprisingly cold. In the desert, it gets pretty chilly at night, but this was ridiculous. As soon as I left the door, my skin stung from the cold. I could see my breath fog out ahead of me as I crossed my arms to keep my body heat in as much as possible. I jogged to the truck and opened the door, rolling up the windows as I got in. I left the driver's side door open as I leaned over to the glove box. As I began to rummage through for my little Zune, I heard a quick shuffling through the dirt near my truck. I immediately shot up in my seat and scanned out the door. There was nothing there, not even a cloud of dust. I looked around for just a moment, feeling a little anxious. When I realized nothing was around me for miles, I shook off the feeling, grabbed my Zune, and headed back for the building. Just as I grabbed the door handle, I heard a shrill cry from deep out in the darkness of the flatlands. The scream sounded like air being let out from a very large balloon mixed with something dying. It made every hair on my body stand on end. I looked around the desert and saw nothing. I've heard what wounded coyotes plenty of times, and I knew I did not hear them this time. I stepped back inside after a short time and couldn't help but wonder, what the hell kind of animal makes a sound like that? I tried to push the whole event out of my head. It took a lot to spook me, but it sure doesn't help being out in the middle of the desert by yourself. I sat down at the monitors again, making a thorough scan over each. Nothing out of the ordinary. I allowed myself to calm down, plugged my headphones into my ears, and loaded up a whole lot of Stevie Ray Vaughan. I was about halfway through flooding down in Texas when I saw it. It was just about 10 p.m. I paused the music and headed for the elevator, with my flashlight, clipboard, and pen. I got in and turned the security key, pressing the only other button on the board. The old, rickety elevator trembled to life and rumbled downwards. The ride seemed like forever, but it was probably about three or four minutes. I couldn't tell if the elevator was slow as hell or if I was heading to the center of the damn earth. Finally, the elevator arrived at its destination, and the sliding metal door creaked open. A freezing draft flowed in, and for some reason, I was reminded of that shrill scream from earlier. Whether it was the memory, or the cold, or both, I got a quick shiver and did what I could to stifle it. I entered the tunnel and looked both ways. It was a straight and narrow tunnel as far as the eye could see. It looked like a painting that would drive you mad if you stared at it for too long. I was instantly grateful that I didn't have to be down here for longer than 25 minutes. As weird as the warning Walter had given me was, it seemed like a sweet deal now. I began my endless walk through the tunnel, checking the wires and connections along the way. Every so often, there was a wattage meter that I would record on my clipboard. I passed one of the cameras as I strode along my way, waving at it with a stupid grin. Then I thought of how much of an ass I am, considering I was the only one who'd be around to look at the monitors. I laughed to myself and kept on down the tunnel. After about 15 minutes of walking, I was beginning to understand why Walter had referred to this as the endless walk. I must have walked a half a mile down the tunnel and nothing looked different. I wasn't getting any closer to the end or even a bend, but I was just about to the end of my so-called route and down to the last meter. I was jotting down the numbers when a wind hit me like I was in front of an industrial sized fan that was blowing in the goddamn Arctic. I shuddered and locked my arms. I looked down the endless walk for the source, but simply saw the same old tunnel of the infinite. I figured this was what Walter was referring to by dangerous. He didn't mention any kind of cooling system, and I sure didn't see any specs or equipment around that would lead me to believe there was one. But it felt like I was about to have my face and balls frozen off, and industrial cooling system and run now were the only two things that made sense. I turned and sprinted to the elevator door. The cold winds began to bellow out a lazy, high-pitched howl somewhere far down the tunnel behind me. At least, I subconsciously prayed it was the wind causing the noise. 
It didn't sound like any howling winds I'd ever heard, but I'd never been in a tunnel miles long with gusts of freezing wind up my backside. I made it to the door in about three minutes flat. I was starting to sweat, and the moisture felt like it was freezing right to my skin. I hastily button mashed the call button, and I heard the old machinery lurch back to life. The door slowly slid open, and I squeezed inside before it had a chance to fully open. I went to button mashing the closed door button this time, and the elevator just ignored me, opening the door all the way, then closing it back slowly, the whole time squealing in a light, metallic voice. Once the door was closed, and I began the shaky ride up, the cold gradually began to fade away. When I reached the top, I had to piss like a racehorse. After a very relieving but slightly paranoid urination session, I headed back for the security room. My night began to dull again and drag on and on. I listened to every SRV song I had on my Zoom, then moved on to shuffle and just went with the luck of the draw. I stepped back outside at one point to walk the grounds and smoke a spliff that was stashed above my sun visor. Thankfully, the cold seemed to pass, and it was just regularly chilly outside. I patrolled the grounds as Jeff Buckley's hallelujah and the spliff sent me into a slight euphoria. The big, shiny moon and the cloudless, dark sky was the perfect setting to hear the poor boy drone gracefully about love lost. Every cloud of dust my steps kicked up flowed away on the wind in slow motion, and I felt like I was wading through it like time was an ocean. Aside from the snap freezing and weird atmosphere that seemed to willingly come and go, I decided this was a pretty decent job so far. Definitely not your normal 9 to 5 at the very least. The night moved at a slow but easy pace. I kept an eye on the cameras, even though the only movement I saw was the occasional tumbleweed passing by outside. I'd had my sandwich and Cheetos along with a big red. Not exactly the most hearty meal, but between the roast beef, provolone, and Dijon, it wasn't too shabby. Hours passed and 2.45 a.m. rolled around. I moaned out of my seat like a weathered old man, both of my knees popping as I came to a stand. I made my way to the Ricky elevator and rode it down the long and narrow elevator shaft. Same bumpy and long ride as earlier, but when I got about five minutes into the ride, things went a little different. The elevator grumbled and shook a little more than usual, and with one heavy jolt, the single dim light in the elevator flickered off. I was in the dark, in a metal box, heading lower and lower into the earth. If I had anxieties, you can bet they would have been firing me up. As it was, I shrugged and wondered how bullshit it would be to die in an elevator in the middle of a desert. Just then, the elevator thumped to a stop and the door creaked open. The lights in the tunnel seemed to be acting up too. The light right above the elevator door was flickering a little. I looked down the walk and in both directions a few of the lights along the tunnel were doing the same. It seemed like there may have been a fluctuation in the levels of electrical current running through the place. Or at least that's what my two years of electrical engineering apprenticeship knowledge seemed to suggest. I went quickly to the first meter along the tunnel. My flashlight glared off the glass and into my eyes. I squinted for a minute, then saw that the levels were a little high, but otherwise fine. I didn't understand what was causing the weird behavior with the lights, but it did not make the walk any easier. I went from meter to meter, each one a hundred feet apart. In between each light that hung by a single wire was 15 feet of darkness. When they would flicker off, it was 40 feet of darkness to walk through. I'm not superstitious and definitely not afraid of the dark, but having the power act up hundreds of feet below the earth isn't appealing. I was already starting to feel ill at ease. I kept a brisk pace as I marched from one meter to the next, trying to ignore the longer and longer stretches of darkness as I made the walk. It seemed that in the dark stretches, the cold would escalate and seep quickly into the bone. I rushed my duties and began to estimate a few numbers instead of calculate them. I was nearing the last meter on my route when I found myself staring right down the middle of the tunnel while I trekked. I didn't realize why the tunnel looked peculiar at first. Then it dawned on me with an odd terror. I could see complete darkness far down the tunnel. Earlier, never once could I see an end to the tunnel. Now, it was pretty far and I could see the lights were completely off after a certain point. I stopped in my tracks and just kept staring. 
I was marginally curious as to what was causing this, but much court more concerned with the feeling of impending dread the sight gave me. It was an illogical dread. Again, I'm not afraid of the dark. But this darkness felt like it wasn't just a lack of light, but a conscious thing that was staring at me, staring past me. And then, it was no longer content with just sizing me up. It began to move on me. The next light popped hundreds of feet down the tunnel, and the darkness lurched towards me. I shivered, but didn't move. The cold began to blow past my ankles and start to flow up to my waist at the, as the howling returned. It was low at first, but started to rise slowly. It was sickly and unlike any wind or animal or human that I could imagine. The next light along the wall popped, and another tw 20 feet of darkness consumed the tunnel, heading my way. I moved this time, spinning around and running back towards the elevator. I booked it, hauling ass as fast as I possibly could without looking back. I could hear light after light pop and fizzle out in a pace that seemed to be getting faster and closer by the second. I half registered now how impressed with myself I was after just over a minute of running I was already back at the elevator. Then again, my adrenaline was pumping like the injector on a V8, so it may have been five minutes for all I know. I clicked that button hard and fast enough to crack it in half. The old metal box groaned awake while I dared to look down the endless walk. The darkness was getting closer and closer, not a single light remaining on in its wake. Finally, the door opened up and I rushed inside. I knew it wouldn't matter, but I still mashed the button to close the door. As it ultimately began to make its motion to close, I could see the darkness catching up to that part of the walk. The bulb above the elevator door popped off just as the door closed. Before it shut, a harsh sliver of freezing wind sliced into me and immediately chilled me to the core. The howling was close, but not quite there, and it was accompanied by something else. Something harder to hear, but there. A sort of scraping sound. The elevator ride remained lights on the whole time, and I was never more grateful for electricity. I got to the top and nearly collapsed in the chair in the security room. I rubbed my throbbing head, then snapped out of my migraine. I rushed to lean forward in my seat and scanned the monitors down the walk. I was expecting, at the very best, pitch black on all four monitors, and at the very worst, some horrible atrocity slithering down the dark, infinite tunnel. But it was neither. All four cameras showed a well enough lit, endless walk with no damage. No giant earthworms or underground trolls scurrying back into the soil. I rubbed my eyes to make sure there was nothing that and that I was awake. I sat back in confusion and pretty much stayed that way the rest of my shift. Once the sun began to peek over the horizon, it was my time to clock out. I was more than eager to punch the clock and get home. I called Walter before I left, but he didn't answer. I left a message filling him in on the weird power fluctuations. I left out the part where I ran like a goddamn sissy out of there. I'm not exactly looking forward to my next shift, but a job's a job, right?